Before we get started, I do want to note that the content of today's episode is not intended to defame, incriminate, embarrass, or harm anyone's image, character, organization, or business entity. As an entertainment news show, we're simply covering a highly publicized case with some very notable figures. Any allegations made today are not explicitly based in fact. Everyone has a right to a fair trial in the court of law here in America. All parties are innocent until proven guilty. That said... Please enjoy today's show. You're listening to Hashtag No Filter with Zach Peter. That's me, your naturally platinum blonde pop culture connoisseur. I'm the reality (laughs) TV junkie, self-improvement addict, and host with only the hottest teas spilled fresh weekly. For more hot takes, you can go and give me a follow at Just Plain Zach. I always keep it funny and I always keep it cute on the gram. And if you're like me and you want to stay up to date with the latest reality tea, give us a follow at No Filter with Zach on the Instagram, or you can always join our private Facebook group. The link is in the description below. Okay, so today's episode is going to be a big one. (laughs) You heard my deep dive into the Tom Girardi scandal, and now we're going even deeper. I have on one of Tom's former clients on the show today, and she is ready to mention it all. Please welcome writer, (laughs) producer, and radio personality, Dana Smuller. Hi, how are you? I'm great. How are you? Fine. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. I'm real excited to speak with you. I'm excited. You're so to have cute. I just on. have to tell you that right up front, though. Aww. You, you're just adorable. <laughs> Thank you. You were you're welcome. You have been so sweet and I've loved chatting with you and I'm excited to actually help get your story out there because I feel like, you know, it's it's a similar experience that a lot of people have had. And now we're starting yeah. to see these stories come forward. Um but before we before we dive into the conversation, I always make my guests do a fun icebreaker where okay. I'm going to ask you some fun questions and we're going to get to know you a little <laughs> bit better to kind of humanize you and just, you know, start off on a fun foot. Okay. Okay. First question is, where did you grow up and what part of the world do you currently live in right now? Um, I'm from Detroit. I grew up <laughs> in Detroit and then moved to Ohio and then in my mid 30s went to New Orleans, then Hollywood then New Orleans, then Las Vegas. And uh, and now I'm back in the Midwest. I love it. Uh, what's, <laughs> what's one word your mom would use to describe you? Shana. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what that means? No, I don't, but it just sounds oh. like a ruckus. <laughs> Beautiful. Oh, I love that. Well, you know, a face only a mother can love, right? <laughs> <laughs> Fun fact, what's one thing people would not expect about you? Um, wow. Uh, you know what? I can't even think of anything. I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. Can we that, come back that, to that, that one? That you're secretly a big Erica Jane music fan? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let, but we jump to the next one. Drink. What is your What is your drink of choice, Dana? Um, like an adult beverage. Yeah. Drink of choice. Uh, an extra dry vodka martini, dirty. Ah, okay. Very similar, but instead of dirty, I like it with a twist. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> so more more yeah. of a gimlet. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> last icebreaker question, which is my favorite to ask: If you sure. had to be reincarnated as a Kardashian, which one would it be? Oh, wow. Wow. It's a Kardashian. Um, You know what? Any of them would be fine. (laughs) They're all pretty. They're killing it right now. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, I I like them all. I love it. So. I you were briefly mentioned in my deep dive into the Girardi Keys scandal. Do you yes. want to give people a little bit of background just about like where you kind of came into the world of entertainment and how this lawsuit even came to be? Yeah, sure. Um, well, actually, I went into radio and then advertising and did a lot of promotions and went into ad agency work as well. 
And um, I was in my mid thirties and I met Larry Muntz, a parapsychologist. And um, so my original deal with him was prove to me what you do is uh, like legitimate. It isn't, you know, a scam right. and I'll make you famous. <laughs> Apparently oh, that, that, that's something about me. Yeah, I had a big opinion of myself <laughs> as far as a publicist goes. And um, so he did as best as he could, but you know, in the realm of the paranormal, you can't really um, uh, prove anything to anybody. It's, it's a very experiential kind of deal. And um, the longer I worked with him, the more experiences I was having. And I, I had experiences all my life and I just figured, oh, I have an overactive imagination, saw it on TV, I dreamt it, whatever. But now I'm having all these experiences while I'm awake and I'm dealing with other people who are as well. And um, so I went into high gear and it was very, it was, it was he was like a, a, a publicist dream um, because it was virgin territory. There were um, a few established uh, organizations around the world, but very secretive, you know, not, not really out in mass media. And, and Larry had done um, like unsolved mysteries and sightings. And I said, no, dude, man, you need to be in mass media, yeah. you know, just like, you know, everything. And that was my goal. And I helped uh, develop ghost expeditions. So it was the first of its kind thing to do in the paranormal field. And of course, we started that in New Orleans. So we had access to all the tourists. And at the time, there might have been like a handful of ghost tours in the entire country. And that was it. But it was like in a massive hit. And um, um, NBC actually did a profile on us for um, what was it, the 1996 Super Bowl. So that was really exciting, um, you know, because it was held in New Orleans. Yeah. And um, oh my God, everything just took off. And so I'm booking Larry on all these shows and and um, in every language, which was kind of hysterical. And um, and then I'm getting dragged into some of it as well. Although I'm kind of like I get really nervous and, and laugh a lot. So in case I do that right now, <laughs> you'll, you'll know why. <laughs> anyway, it was amazing. And ghost expeditions were sold out three times a day. And I was doing most of them. So I was in the field in haunted locations with other people, with entities that I came to know. And, and it was just it was just absolutely amazing. But when I originally got involved with Larry, in addition to what I told him my deal was, he told me about um, that he saw a reality show, which he had actually discussed with um, some an executive producer whose name escapes me, but was working on Adam Twelve. This was like a million years ago when he when Larry used to work for Hugh Hefner at Playboy, and uh, so he this was a dream of his was doing a show that focused on investigations, and this is years before reality. Mm -hmm. as we know. And when we got in, uh, together, the only reality shows out there, you know, like that we were aware of was like um, uh, Road Rules and Real World mm -hmm. on MTV and Cops. Mm -hmm. And that was it. So anyway, so we're in New Orleans for a couple of years and Larry was originally from New Orleans. And um, but he had gone back to New Orleans where I met him from Hollywood. He had been there for many, many years. All right. Okay. So he says, we should go back to Hollywood because now the studios are calling us and wanting us to do uh, promotions like um, originally with MGM and Reicher. And I was like, oh, my God, Hollywood, because I had never been to California. And I yeah. was like, I should, you know, I felt like kind of ripped off, like I should have bought, you know, been born there. But uh, that didn't happen. So we go out to to L.A., and go to Hollywood and we find a place to live. We take over the Vogue Theater on Hollywood Boulevard, which is two blocks east of Man's Chinese. And it's like, oh my God, this is gonna be our, our office. And uh, turns out the theater was uh, actively haunted. Uh -huh. And so in addition to making it a funky space for um, uh, film festivals and all different kinds of special events, we started running ghost expeditions in the theater because it was pretty active and uh, the entities were, they were happy to play. Absolutely. And we started doing tons 
of television. And we did a lot of promotions. And, um, and then we start pitching our show. And so later on, when it, during the lawsuit years, as I affectionately call it, um, not really, but uh, it, it, it was like, um, oh, who are these people? But we dealt with everybody in Hollywood. And, and, and it wasn't like just somebody's secretary, which there's nothing wrong with that. But um, it was all development uh, people and, and vice presidents and presidents of studios and, and um, just, you know, like kind of high powered people. And um, we, you know, it was, we were constantly pitching and everybody said, well, you'll never have more than like two minutes to make a pitch. And we were always in there for like an hour and a half wow. because it's a very interesting topic. And, and, you know, it wasn't like really out there. And what seemed to kill it, well, we were kind of like ahead of our time. And people were like, um, well, what if we don't see a ghost on camera? And Larry would always say, well, do you want to see them like on the stairs, dancing, singing, doing a little jig? And they're like, yeah. And Larry's like, oh my God. Yeah. But, but I mean, it was, it was always kind of a joke, but we told them that it was rare that they would really see something. Um, but, but you could, you could um, see atmospheric fluctuations. You could tell uh, differences in people that were being affected. And since we wanted to use a team, we would see a lot of um, their interactions with each other and interactions with uh, earthbound entities in the properties that we went into. So blah, 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 blah. And we're pitching, we're pitching, we're pitching. And now we're pitching in England and the United States. And one of our English uh, investigators was, uh, became, uh, he, he was famous for being a psychic and then became very famous as working with us. And, um, but that's like another story. <laughs> but out of that came Most Haunted, which you might remember that. Yep. And uh, yeah, so anyway, uh, we're pitching all over. And in 2001, um, and 2000, yeah, 2001, we're, we're uh, uh, pitching uh, heavily and then to beginning of 2002. And at this point, we um, have a contract with Image Entertainment out of New York and Columbia TriStar Television right in your backyard, and which used to be right in my backyard. And uh, so we, we made all the pitches and there was always some kind of uh, um, obstacle, like whoever was going to sell advertising for it, for whatever entertainment entity, you know, oh, well, you know, this is, this is a scam and psychic abilities don't, you know, they don't it exist. Is, blah, blah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So, so anyway, uh, at, at this time in January of 2002, we have this pitch meeting set up at NBC, courtesy of the president of Columbia TriStar, uh, TriStar Television, who tells us, I believe in this property 110%, and I'm going to do anything it takes to get it sold. So he sets it up with his friend, Jeff Zucker, who is now the president of NBC. And um, we have this, we're in like this huge pitch meeting, and we have a uh, uh, the president and development people from Image that have flown back in from New York. We have um, the president and vice president from TriStar Television and uh, Columbia TriStar. And um, uh, let me see, Emil Levasetti, I believe, from Industry Entertainment, if I remember correctly. He did like um, Hope and Grace, a whole bunch of different uh, sitcoms at the time. And Joe Berlinger, who is now... Uh, uh, his name recognition is going up again um, because he did uh, what Hotel Cecil. Uh, oh, yes, 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 yes. Well, he had just come off Blair Witch 2 at that time. OK. And he had a first look deal with Columbia TriStar. So that's how he got attached. And and it was funny because at that time during those pitches, he said to me more than once, you know, you guys are just overexposed. And it's like, there is like no, there, at this point now, there's like a thousand paranormal uh, investigative groups in the country that have just like popped up in the last few years. But we were, we were, we were everywhere. We, you know, it, it was us. And uh, so I thought that was kind of funny. So we have this pitch meeting with uh, Jeff Zucker 
And uh, it, for some reason, when it came to me, they asked me to explain why we use thermal imaging in the field. Okay. <laughs> so I start explaining it in layman's terms uh, because I am a layman. I'm not the one even running the camera. Right. And uh, so um, Jeff Zucker reacted to that like... <sighs> Well, that kind of like a reaction. Okay. And it stopped me in mid sentence. And I had gone like days without any sleep. So I was kind of like in a pissy mood anyway. And it was like, God, how rude. And it just, it just threw me off, uh, off kilter. And so Larry, um, in so many words, um, and in kind of a polite way, basically lets Jeff Zucker know in front of everybody that He's an ignorant ass. And yeah. So Jeff Zucker stands up and goes, this pitch, pitch meeting's over. And he, um, as we were walking out, he stuck his hand out for me to shake it. And I remember him squeezing it real tight and said, good luck trying to sell your show. And when we left, then we found out that the um, president of Columbia TriStar Television, uh, wanted nothing to do with us anymore because we insulted his friend. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I can kind of understand. Um, so that's uh, kind of got the ball rolling. It's like, well, screw these people. We're going to shift it. And um, so the big connection, it just so happens that um, not only did almost everybody we deal with um, know, like Craig Poligian from Pilgrim, mm -hmm. OK, um, but the president of Columbia TriStar Television also worked with him. In fact, um, one of their earliest ventures together was Worst Case Scenarios for TBS. Uh -huh. And uh -huh, yeah, so there was no denying it. And they were working together at that time. And um, anyway, so a little time passes. And and um, if I remember correctly, the president of Columbia TriStar was fired because they were not dropping hit television shows anymore. And um, so he went on to open up his own um, agency that um, submerged uh, product placement mm -hmm. into, into uh, television. And lo and behold, then uh, there's Ghost Hunters, um, you know, with uh, Roto-Rooter Plumbers. And so what was the original concept that you guys came in and pitched? So the original concept was a team of paranormal investigators led by a parapsychologist. And it was a combination of scientific um, equipment run by, you know, people that weren't is necessarily psychically inclined and a team of psychics. So it was a combo and we would go into different properties and, um, do an investigation and discover who was there and all the reasons why. And, um, and then it would be substantiated by um, third party, whatever research after the fact. And we had a full pilot okay. uh, shot and produced and that was submitted. Did the project have a, a name originally? Originally it was ghost hunters ah. and uh, uh -huh. and then we changed it to haunted and um uh just because we kind of felt ghost hunters was it was just kind of rude yeah you know and we weren't hunting ghosts we didn't right, we, right you right. know but but we but that was we did go in and said we we would live with that title you know if that was kind of like the base element title and um but we also pitched it we we thought of um haunted and ghost expeditions so we laid it out like that and there were um three different treatments which later got produced exactly so when you order. saw it how did you was it a commercial you saw on tv was it the actual airing of the show when you actually saw ghost hunters come to fruition on television and you weren't a part of it what was that moment like for you well, I actually saw it during, um, uh, they, it was, I, I don't know what the day was. I mean, it was in 2005 and they were running a marathon and um, I was, had turned on the TV for something and I came across that and I was like, I should watch this. And Larry wasn't around. So I was the one <laughs> that watched it and it was like, oh my God, oh my God. And 
he looks like Larry did. And which he did at the time, you know, um, it's like before the buff years. And uh, yeah, it was like, oh, my God. And, and there was, you know, all this background on the interaction of the people in, in the group. And it was like, um, yeah. So how and when did the lawsuit come about? So the lawsuit came about. Um, so I went to um, actually our storage and I pulled out all these boxes of all this paperwork. And it was like, you know, I find like this paperwork on over a hundred different entertainment um, professionals that we dealt with in Hollywood while we were pitching. And Plus, there was like all, all the footage and then all the letters and all the emails from a gazillion different shows. Hey, can you can you participate in this? Can we use your book, you know, on the shelf up, uh, on this and blah, 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 blah. And um, it was just it was overwhelming. So we had to find an attorney that would take it on contingency because from our initial calls, they only wanted like five million dollars as a retainer. And um it was like, okay, I can write you a check, just don't cash it. Right, right. <laughs> so <laughs> that's just not going to happen right this moment. And um, plus, we were involved in, we had already shot two, two documentaries in England. I mean, that we created and produced. We, we shot those. Um, we, you know, had just um, uh, cleared and, and gave back the Vogue Theater. Uh, I mean, there was like a lot of other projects always in, in the works. Mm -hmm. And, but anyway, so we're looking, we're looking, we're looking. And um, there was a publicist. Uh, she's a rocker publicist, like handled like Ozzy Osbourne and all, all kinds of like cool rockers. And um, we met her and she brought uh, uh, an attorney to the table okay. who was this like really cool woman. Uh, she's a, a single practitioner from Beverly Hills and she's also a mediator. But um, she and she taught at Pepperdine as well. And she was just like, like, no, no bull and um, straightforward. And like, you have to prove it to me. And so when we met with her, and we laid out a sample of our paperwork, which like came in a great big box. And she was like, Oh, my God, I've never seen like, anybody have so much stuff. But I mean, that's all we did. Right. And you know, so we had it. So she was our first attorney and she's the one that actually filed the lawsuit. Okay. So, and, and this was way before, this was before uh, Girardi Keese came into the picture. This, right. right and so absolutely. when did it move over to Girardi Keese? Because was, was the first case dismissed or what happened that it had to be refiled, right? Well, it, it did. What happened was, um, uh, Catherine, our original attorney, um, NBC is just, you know, uh, batting all this paperwork at her. And they told her point blank, we're going to bury you in paperwork and make you go bankrupt. So she told us that we really needed the strength of a firm behind us um, because she's a single practitioner and doesn't have endless pockets. And, you know, I mean, because NBC, that's no, you know, yeah, you know, and uh, so uh, we're like, oh my god, we don't even know where to start looking now. And she said, I can help you look. And she brought another law firm to the table, and they were from the valley, and uh, it was two female partners and a and a female attorney, all all chick team here, and um, it was a, a rather large law firm. And uh, so we went with Catherine, we brought all the paperwork, everything, and they were so excited. They thought this was like the greatest thing. I mean, literally, they were so excited. And uh, so they had, I don't remember why, but they were supposed to, um, they were work, they were to work with NBC's law firm, do some amendments in the complaint, and then you file the amended complaint. Um, I hope that makes sense because I did not go to law school. So, uh, okay. Anyway, so this is like a couple months later and they're working on it and we're staying in touch. You know, we keep sending them paperwork, blah, blah, blah. And um, we went to meet with them on a Tuesday and it was a few, a couple days before uh, the amended complaint was due. And they were so excited. And Larry and I left and we go across the street. And I'll never forget this. We were sitting in a Burger King 
And I started crying. And Larry's like, what is your problem? And I said, they're going to drop the case. And he's like, um, what, what planet are you from? Because you were just there. And I'm like, no, I'm telling you, they're going to drop the case. And he's like, you know, like, yeah, he just thinks I'm crazy. And um, so two days later, we get a phone call from one of the female partners who put some guy on the phone who tells us basically that um, we're like losers and this case is garbage and they're dropping it. And, you know, we need to go away and blah, blah, blah. And he's so incredibly rude to us. And it's like, and who the hell are you? And it turns out he was a senior partner in the firm. Okay. And we found out later he had ties to wait for it, NBC. Mm. And so they, but what we didn't know is that um, they can't just do that. We didn't know that mm -hmm. they have to give you a good reason or go to court, you know, or, you know and, and prove to a judge why they should drop the, the case. But we didn't know, and we were just like, oh, my God, because it was due, the amended complaint, it was due the next day. And we're not attorneys. So now we're our own attorneys in federal court wow. with, with NBC's attorneys. So, you know, not too much pressure there. And uh, so they gave us time, a little time, and but there was still stuff going on between the NBC attorney and uh, the court. There was nothing we could do about it because we were just not in the know and we're not our own. We're, we weren't attorneys. So, so things, things just go downhill quickly, but we don't give up. Right. And because we're pissed and this is our second lawsuit against NBC. I mean, we won the first one in five days and, um, but we didn't go after any money. We just wanted our show back right. so we could pitch it. And um, which Turns out to have been a stupid move, actually. But <laughs> that's another long story. But um, anyway, so uh, it took us until June. Um, and boom, by um, word of uh, by other people, we were um, guided to Tom Girardi. So we, that's how we met him. And Larry, oh, I'm sorry. Were you gonna no, I was going to say, had you heard of him or had you known who Tom Girardi was prior to? No. Okay. No, no. Uh -uh. And um, uh, no, I, I didn't really know who any of the attorneys in L.A. were. I thought they were all Harry Hamlin, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> sorry. So anyway, um I apparently I'm my own biggest fan here, uh, but, um, <laughs> so, uh, we go and, and we, uh, oh, Larry speaks to him first okay. and Tom Girardi let him know that he was on his own private plane. He was boarding oh. his plane. And so of course I'm like, wow, okay, that's cool. That must be a good sign. And Larry, who's a little more like, or was in your face than I am. He, he says, um, are you afraid of NBC? <laughs> and, uh, and Tom Girardi says, I'm not afraid of anybody. And I've sued everyone in Hollywood and I've never lost a case. Wow. And so, and I was right there when he was on the phone with them. I was like, Oh, okay, cool. And um, so we brought him a letter from Bonnie Hammer, who was the president of sci-fi at the time. And um, she loved the show. And uh, we brought him that and the filing paperwork, the original complaint that, that had been filed. And, and then uh, a couple of weeks later, we went back to New Orleans uh, to uh, bring to fruition or start working on another huge, huge project um, that was of Larry's design. So the original, um, so you had the, the female attorneys that were helping you with the case originally, they ended yeah. up backing out. So you guys had to represent yourself. And then what was the oh, reason wow. the case ended up getting kiboshed originally? Originally. So, so we're in new Orleans and, um, time has elapsed and, uh, um, our, uh, uh, one of the attorneys, uh, the copyright expert for Tom Girardi, and it, they work in tandem on okay. everything with us. And so he said, Graham calls us and he says, look, and he says, if you can prove copyright back a few years, 
you, you win hands down because the the um, lawsuit was filed originally uh, in federal uh, court because they had a federal uh, a violation of copyright. And then there were all these state claims. And what Hollywood was well known for doing was sweeping all state claims underneath uh, federal copyright. And then they come back up. Yeah, I don't see any. I don't see uh, similarities. And then the case and gets then everything tossed. gets tossed. Right. But for some reason, um, the judge who ruled originally, the federal judge, thought that there was some merit there. And um, so that was lucky. In so anyway, so we're, we go back up a few years and um, Graham says, so like, if you can prove copyright and I'm like, yeah, I have a, a floppy disk with all the treatments in WordPerfect. I mean, that's probably older than you are. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, right. So um, we find it and send it to him and a uh, little uh, time elapses. And then he contacts us again by phone and says, no, um, your case is real weak. And we're like, what? And he says, yeah. Um, so if you wrote and in your treatment and they rewrote it and said, in addition to it's going to be tossed, you lose. So you need to voluntarily uh, kill your own copyright claim and let us go to the appellate level and try and get two state claims uh, in um, uh, the, the right to refile with two state claims only. Two out of like all the, the original list. Okay. And we're like, no, it's, it's copyright. I mean, you know, we're not attorneys, but we're not that stupid either. And um, so they're like, well, we're going to drop it. We're going to drop it. We're going to drop it. So here we're at, in New Orleans. We're working on this huge project and they're Girardi Keys. And it's like, well, apparently, I guess we don't know. So we agreed, not real happy about it, but we did. And um, so they went to the, uh, so you know, it looks like we're like, hey, like we changed our mind or something. And our case gets killed at the federal level. And um, they go to um, appellate court. And there's, uh, this is supposed to be in front of three judges. And it gets uh, pushed. Uh, the trial or the hearing gets pushed a little bit into the future. And uh, at that hearing, it was uh, a visiting judge that presided. He was in charge of the three three judge panel, a visiting judge who didn't seem, uh, uh, according to my research afterwards, um, had a lot to do with uh, entertainment law. And so anyway, uh, they send in Howard Miller, who is a partner at Girardi Keys, who we have not met yet at this point, who um, at that time was the recent uh, 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 president of the California State Bar Association. So we're like jackpot, right? I mean, how great is this? Yeah. So uh, we hear right after the hearing, and at this point, we're it, it, uh, um, moving to Vegas, and uh, and and that's that's another story. And at this point, we are told repeatedly. You cannot do any more television. You can't do any more radio. You can't write another book. You can't do any inter interviews for print anymore. In fact, you can't even go flip burgers because we'll drop your case. You just hide. That's just strange. Just be quiet, hide. Yeah. So we go to, uh, we, we choose Las Vegas because we'll be close to LA, but we also know the whole place is wired. <laughs> so... We're, we're kind of getting like some threatening emails. So we figured if like we exploded in a car one day, it would be caught on video. So, you know, hopefully they find out who it was. <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, then we find out from Girardi Keys that, well, from Graham, who contacts us and says, uh, yeah, your case was tossed. And it's like, what? And yeah, and she, he, he says that um, our original attorney was an idiot. And he kept calling her that like, for, for the next several years too, starting that day. And she made a mistake and um, it, it got, it got tossed. It was, you know, it was the way she worded the complaint and uh, you know, oh, well, and we're like, well, can't you do anything? And well, there's something called an on bank, but mm, we don't think that 
we would be granted an on-bank hearing. And so, yeah, no, later much. And neither Larry, Larry was out of town at the time. So he spoke to him from out of town. And um, we were so absolutely like, mind blown that we never thought of asking Grant, what was the mistake? Mm. You know, what was it? And, and not only did we not think of that, but we didn't think of, why didn't you catch a mistake? You know, here's right. Girardi Keys. You know, it's like, so. You have the and, power of a whole law firm behind you. Yes, yes. Now, Graham did say that when Howard went in, that um, he could just tell by the demeanor of the judge that it was just going to go south. And it's like, what, what is that? Really? You know? And um, anyway, so a few months go, go by and um, Larry takes me to see Rick Springfield in concert. That's what a lot of people don't, well, people who know me know <laughs> I love Rick Springfield. Yeah. So that, that kind of brought me back to life a little. It's like, okay, life goes on. And several months later, uh, were informed by Graham out of the blue that uh, the visiting judge who ruled against us has requested both sides to uh, enter paperwork stating why uh, this case actually should go forward or why it shouldn't. And uh, we're like, great. And then we find out that uh, one of the things that he ruled against us was uh, that basically Larry and I were just, you know, you know, yahoos, and we're just pitching our show all over the place, but we didn't want to get paid or anything. We just wanted, you know, to pitch our show. And um, because the the complaint didn't say that we wanted compensation. So in the original complaint, it says, blah, 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 and they want compensation. So he just kind of dismissed that. So apparently what happened was that a lot of the other judges were like, mm, it's a little too blatant and forced him to take this action ah. so yeah so uh, a tr uh, an on-bank panel is set for december of 2011 so we uh travel into uh in, in pasadena so uh <laughs> and uh we go to court and uh it was just wild and, and howard and graham are there to represent us and howard did all all the the talking and it's like an hour long and and the whole hearings on youtube and um howard uh at one point says like respectfully i want you to know basically you missed a line in the complaint it says in black and white they they wanted to get paid and uh so yeah it was you know the so this is so lawsuits back in play and so now nbc takes it to the u.s supreme court they apply uh, to the U.S. Supreme Court to hear this, and they get everybody to write amicus briefs against us. The motion picture, uh, 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 what is it? And, and help me with this. The, the motion picture uh, society, um, you know, that does the ratings. Yes. Why is the yes. name blank? I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I know it's the association. Just that kind yeah. of a day, yes. right? And, and they have like every network, every movie studio writing against us. Oh, they're just such awful people, you know, and this is just going to kill us in Hollywood. Oh, my God. And um, so the U.S. Supreme Court, finally, um, our hearing, our, our matter comes up and they're like, mm, nah, because I guess we had to turn in a lot of stuff with it, you know, at, 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 to answer it. And um, they're like, no. No, go, go back and play in California. So we're like, yay. And, and that was wonderful. So it goes back to California. And the chief judge in um, that district uh, canceled the hearing between Girardi Keys and NBC's attorneys. And I was like, no, you, this needs to go to trial. And you just need to do the right thing. And we're like, yay. And it's so exciting. And um, so our original trial was set for like, I, if I remember correctly, uh, April 2013, because it was right around my birthday. And uh, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of preparing mm -hmm. for this by our attorneys, not to mention we have been giving our attorneys all this information. It's like, 
you got to add, you got to add the president of Columbia TriStar Television, you know, and, and, and here are all the people that worked with us that worked with Polygian. I mean, talk about six degrees of Kevin Bacon. We were one degree away from Polygian a hundred times over and not in a like, hey, you know, we saw you at a coffee shop. Right. It was like working with them. Right. And um, yeah. So but they refused to talk to us about it. We called them about it so many times. We sent them so many emails. I mean, we sent them faxes, everything. No. Nope. And they didn't include anything in there. So when um, uh, NBC went for a uh, motion for summary judgment, uh, Polygian and, and the plumber was allowed out of the lawsuit. Mm. Oh, with the other plumber, um, he was, had quit the job for a while, uh, the show for a while. So, um, which we got blamed for that too. Like, how dare you people like pick on him? But so anyway, all this time we're being quiet in Vegas, right? I mean, we're talking years. And um, one day I decided to do a search on us because it's just, it just felt really weird and we're gone. We, we have been removed from everything, everything. The only thing under my IMDb, which still exists today, is uh, horror kung fu theater, you know, because because that looks real reputable. And um, although it really was, and it's run by a really cool guy in California, yeah. does a lot of work with kids. So, um, but, you know, we did like over 100 shows there, you know, and IMDb won't, won't mark any of them and uh all the other uh shows that we did are gone from like the different production companies uh imdb pages interesting yeah yeah yeah. like for example here's the travel channel right and they do um uh, um every year they do america's scariest attractions so they do year one we do year two while we were in New Orleans working on this project. And, uh, and then they do year three. Well, at this point, you can find year one, you can find year three, year two. Poof, it's gone. It doesn't exist anymore. It's like, poof. <laughs> so, and that's what happened with everything. We are so, we have been so erased from the internet. And, um, I'm, I'm telling Girardi keys and they're like, Oh, you're so full of yourself. And it's like, what? You know, I mean, it, this was legitimate. And, right. and so oh, were, go, were go. any of these conversations, were you working with Tom d- directly or was it all Graham and Howard? Uh, m- m- most of it was, it was through Graham. Okay. And, and so when we would talk, it was like, well, Tom and I decided, Tom and I decided, Tom and I, and, and, you know, there was some separation there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But we thought, um, Howard, we loved Howard. You know, he was like, he was like, seemed like a real upstanding guy. And, oh my God, we just, we just thought he was great. So the Absolutely. case comes back to California. It looks like it's going to move through. You kind of don't have yes. much communicate. You're not hearing from Girardi Keys. What yes. then happens? So now you're in April and you find out that you've so, been removed. So so they, so um, they've done stuff without telling us ahead of time. And um, they never kept us in the loop. Stuff like what? And they um, different hearings. Okay. Uh, yeah. And so now... Um, our trial has been moved to October of okay. 2013. And it was originally supposed to be in April? In April. Okay. April, yes. And so Graham uh, files some ex parte something, which uh, what we understood was it asked the judge to go through every single thing that has been submitted. Keep in mind, we have submitted thousands of documents, including footage, thousands. And, and um, it's requesting the judge to go through every single thing to see if they find any single problem. And what we didn't know until later was that something defendants do, not plaintiffs. Mm. And, but but um, our law firm requested that. And then 
re uh, requested that they seal, that the judge seal all our documents because Craig Poligian gave a figure in some piece of paperwork and, you know, it was for attorney eyes only. And so he sh they should seal all the documents in the case. Well, I would not be able to stand here talk to you about what I used to do or anything if everything had been sealed. sealed. Yep. Why would your own attorney do that? Did they give you a reason as to why they did that? No, no. We had called and asked why and left a message, of course. And then we looked this this term up and uh, and we got, oh, we just figured that, you know, the Girardi Keys was making a stand to NBCC. We're just we, we have so much. We're going to bury you there. You have no no room. And um, and then if I remember correctly, and I'm sure there's like a lot of things I'm not remembering because I have kind of it's been a while. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's been a while. And I, it, it's been hard to think about. And um, and then the next thing, there's a motion for summary judgment which is also heard in the spring of 2013. And, uh, and that's when the judge has to release Polygian and, um, and, uh, and one of the plumbers out of the lawsuit because we have not proven any access to them mm. because, uh huh. And uh, so anyway, uh, it's, but we win. We still win summary judgment. And, and uh, there is now we hear that there's some kind of um, filing issue with the original complaint that uh, it should have been filed on November 6th. I think it was like November 6th of, 2000, uh, of 2006. And, but it was stamped November 8th. And Catherine always used this a particular filing service. And on the paperwork, it has the filing services fax number it went through because she gave us the, the originals. And, but the court, and it shows that it was faxed to the court on, on that day. And, uh, but the court stamped it two days later. Interesting. So what- but what Here's what's really interesting okay. is Catherine used this this uh, filing company all the time for all her cases. She told us that. And so Larry and I call this filing company and they're like, we've never heard of her. No, we don't have this paperwork. We have no record of this and we don't know who she is. What? Yeah. 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 So where do you, so how are all the pieces, connect all the pieces for me? Because there are, you know, what is, where do you think the IMDB page and the filing service, how do you think these all connect and relate to your case? Well, uh, we believe that we were purposely removed. And of course, all this time we're blaming NBC and that NBC's got the long arms. Um, but uh, uh, we truly believe that our own law firm was assisting because back when the case, when they told us we needed to um, uh, give up the copyright and let them go to, to the appellate level to see if we could refile the case, and then refile wasn't the old one, yeah. refile um, with the state claims. It, it's just interesting now because right. considering everything that's happened, um, I think, oh, my God. That's when it was announced that Real Housewives franchise was moving into Beverly Hills. Mm, okay. Okay. And um, yeah. And um, I had read articles while uh, Gerardi Keys was our uh, law firm about his wife and um, about bringing her to parties and stuff. And this was like, and I had never seen this franchise. Okay. I and mean, none of it. And, and I, I'm pretty sure I know it started in the OC, I yes. think, but you know, I, I, aside from general hospital, I'm not like a, a huge TV, <laughs> junkie. TV. just yeah. too busy working right. and away from a TV seriously, you know, so it's no, no offense, but um, so it's just very interesting that our case is tossed on something so stupid and so not legitimate 
And it's like, was that supposed to work to Tom Girardi's benefit to help his wife? Who ended up coming on Real yeah. Housewives of Beverly Hills within yes. like a year after the case was dismissed. It, it, so when when we when our case totally goes away and what we're told by Girardi Keys is you have no options. You're 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 done. And and uh Tom was kind enough to leave us a voicemail months earlier, you know, you're toast. You're toast. And um, which I saved. And um <laughs> I've heard it, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so uh it's uh so it goes away totally on April 1st of 2014. And she's like in the next season. So well, well, let's go, let's go back to the April before when the case was originally supposed to be heard and then it got delayed to that fall. So what happened between that April and that fall when the case was pushed? That's I'm assuming. So during that time we have the motion for summary judgment, right? And the, the judge gives his initial tentative ruling in June and and so we're told by Girardi Keys, oh, it's a fluke, you suck. And like now they're being very, very derogatory toward us. And which um, is interesting, and, which I just want to say is interesting because you're their client and and they're oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. You would think yeah. that they would not have that sort of um attitude because yeah, because ultimately yeah. they win if you win, and you would think that they're be- like they would yes. be gaining the most by supporting you and, and pushing this lawsuit through. Yes. Now, but there was a, there was a lot of other things too, because the um, second law firm that NBC brought in was also dealing with a ton of lawsuits against NBC. And many of them came back to life because of our case. So there was a lot at stake here. Plus it was for a lot. It was for three shows um, of the ghost hunter shows. And then they went in with like every show, paranormal reality show that came up on any NBC owned and operated or affiliated network was also part of it. And, and we're not talking about all the, all the rest of the costs, the merchandise, the conventions, right, right. everything else. I mean, it was like at minimum, we were told we'd probably walk out with a few hundred million. Was this case, was it a contingent case? Were they? Yes. Okay. So you weren't even paying So they were going to make a lot of yeah. money. Yes. Yeah. They were yes. going to make, okay. So yes. just so I, as an outsider looking in, it looks like, okay, this seems like a fairly winnable case. Um, yes. It seems like it, it it's, a, why would they invest all of the time into continuing this case if they weren't being, like, I would understand delaying it if you were paying them to keep the case going because then they're still getting getting money, but if it's a right. case based off of contingency, then they only right. really get the benefit if they win the lawsuit. So right. for them to have an attitude of, oh, well, you're not going to win anyway, and for them to kind of be dismissing it was but, sounds but interesting. But see, the thing is, is with Howard Miller, he, all along, you won. There is not a thing NBC can do except settle with you or go to trial and let a jury decide how much they're going to pay you. Right. And so, so when it originally uh, was looking extremely bad, I'm sitting there thinking maybe there would be more appeals by NBC because they have deep pockets. Right. Girardi's an old guy and he would be dead. Yeah. So that's what I was thinking. Okay. That's what I was thinking. And, um, but I, I, and there, there, there seemed to be, I mean, I can't tell you a hundred percent, but there were a lot of people that we dealt with over, over the years um, before we went into uh, isolation that seemed to uh, find out about the case and have a windfall at the same time, you know, uh, like construction workers on our project were being offered their own investigative series on, on sci-fi. Seriously? And we, Larry and I got blacklisted immediately throughout Hollywood. Nobody wanted to talk to us anymore. I mean, we knew everybody. Nobody wanted to talk to us anymore. And so, but, but hey, hey, Tom Girardi, that's their attorney. Let's, let's welcome her, his wife. Does that make sense? And, and, and him? That, that, I mean, the timing is very convenient, very coincidental. <laughs> it's very coincidental. And so yeah. 
when <laughs> so you have the converse so you you get the voicemail from Tom that says that you're toast. <laughs> then January you know January second. Mm-hmm. And then, mm-hmm. so the the case is finally dismissed the following April, correct? That uh, April first, twenty fourteen. And what was the reason the case was kiboshed? Um, they said that it was because uh, they went and killed our trial first. Our our attorneys went Kiesel. behind our backs in in early September of twenty thirteen, canceled our trial, and said that they were moving it into twenty fourteen with the date to be. Uh, determined. And we find out in December when they forced us to go to mediation with NBC uh, that now there's a statute of limitations issue. And it's all um, that idiot Catherine's fault. And um, because she filed two days late and um, she's an idiot and it's all attorney error or else you would have won. And it was like, um, Now, this just went through like 30 plus judges, the U.S. Supreme Court, a gazillion different lawyers, and nobody, nobody killed the case like on day one or in year two or year four or five. For that same statute of limitations issue with the filing date on the paperwork and when it was stamped. Yeah, but they didn't tell us that (laughs) until, until, uh. Uh, the mediation, that now it's a problem. It came up during the MSJ and the uh, a judge said, mm, no, uh, like, because it was out, you know, it, 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 there, were, there was like some weird aspects of it. Like you could tell what day it was faxed in, what day the court stamped it. And the fact uh, of delayed discovery which would have been 2005. And the case was originally a copyright case, which is federal, which has a three-year statute. Mm. So, and, and the judge ruled that this is a triable issue. So. So you yeah. lost not because there was no merit to the case, but on a technicality. Right. right. On a, an attorney 101 statute of limitations issue that our rock star law firm blames entirely <laughs> on the sole practitioner and they they totally like they had nothing to do with it it's like how did you not catch this and if you did why didn't you ever tell us so what happened after the case ends up getting dismissed what what happens then what were those conversations you had with them afterwards there were no conversations or afterwards. Were, were there any, already were any of the were, concerns that you had did you bring them up to the firm no, they wouldn't talk to us. Girardi dropped our case back in earlier in March. And it's like, what? And, and, and he informed us in like a two sentence letter, you know, you know, basically go to hell and go away. And uh, he contacted Howard and he's like, no, there's no decision yet. So that, that was, uh, yeah. So no, and by the time April 1st came around, we were seriously devastated. Here we've been battling this for nearly for a decade. Yeah. And and we're not working because they're going to drop our case. And uh, there's there was like, now we're in total survivor, so survival mode. And that's the way it lasted until Larry died. Wow. And Larry passed away in 2017? No. 2019. 2019. Oh, wow. So, yes. very, so recently. Yes. Yes. So, um, but he, uh, you know, we were not, um, we didn't have the money that we used to have and uh, we were not able to take care of ourselves really well. And he was a little bit older than me and in uh, his health deteriorated uh, faster than mine. Oh. And um, yeah. And, and, and then Every, here we are, absolute uh, nobodies in the mass media or or the the general in, in pop culture because we have been erased now and then uh, we have been replaced by the Warrens. Uh, are you familiar with who they are? No. So uh, 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 
the guy, he, he was, he was a photographer and his wife was a psychic and, and they were originally involved in the original Amityville case a okay. long time ago. And one of their cases became like a movie of the week starring, um, Sally Kirkland. I think it was called the haunted. Um, if I remember correctly, and it was, it was a scary movie on TV. And I think this was in the late seventies. Uh, I'd have to check, but but that was that was the Warrens. All of a sudden, now now they're like being heralded as they're the ones. Like you know, like we were never on the scene before. And so the Annabelle franchise mm -hmm. movies. That's the Warrens. That's the Warrens and the Conjuring, all, all that. And we dealt with uh, two of the producers when we were in Vegas, and. Uh, and they're like, yeah, it's all bullshit. And it's like, but you're putting it out there like it's real. And, you know, in the 70s, here's another thing. I just have to say this. In the 70s, when Exorcist came out and then afterward, Am uh, Amityville Horror. And these were scary, you know, big budget movies at, at, at the movies. And, and so if the Warrens had really good cases like that. Don't you think that it is, since these horror films on the big screen are now making a lot of money, because that was really kind of the kickoff of that, that they would have used more of their cases to make more movies and not wait until what, like, you know, after our, our lawsuit goes away, which, by the way, Annabelle was the most famous ghost at the Vogue Theater. And um, she, too, was um, eight years old, had braided hair, you know, I don't know. So. Wow. Yeah, but that was one of their cases. So I don't know. I'm not here to to fight with with Lorraine and her husband because they're <laughs> gone. They're gone. So what? A, so when all of this broke with Tom Girardi and Girardi Keys recently in the past like year or so, when all of that started to come out, what did you think? Starting to see his name caught up with all these other cases. Yeah, so I, I I don't I think it was the beginning of December that I found uh, it, it came up in my feed for some reason um, on Google that uh, Tom Girardi's wife uh, filed for divorce and I remember like kind of like ha, ha ha you know it's like yeah because she got she's probably you know you know doing somebody younger and you know with money and you know, yeah, yeah. And, you know right and uh, so i was like okay okay and then um more stuff i guess because i clicked on that more stuff kept started coming up in my feed uh about that so later on in december um i find out about this plane crash and and this law lawsuit against uh girardi and that there are other ones and and this law firm is actually making headway against him because i don't know the guy i think has gotten away with a lot of stuff over the years you know and uh i'm like oh my god and it has always um really fried my ass that this guy left this toast voicemail especially since he left it on my phone right and it was on january 2nd to kick off the year uh back in in uh 20 was it 2014 and um it just pissed me off and and you know i always blame them uh you know for larry's uh poor health and not being able to to get better and um so i'm seeing all this stuff and i'm like damn who's toast now and so uh <laughs> saturday night and at this point it actually didn't even make my blood pressure go up and i uh typed out this email to tom and i copied graham and and howard and you know said that in all the years that i uh you know tried to convince larry that one day you know uh, his evil doings would come to light and he would get in trouble. And so if he ended up in prison or died or both, I wanted to take this opportunity right now to tell him in his own words, he's toast. And I attached the copy of the voicemail and I sent it. And then I laughed for like 40 minutes. I just thought it was, it was such a relief. You know, I mean, it, it may sound, oh, poor Tom, but 
seriously, it was such a relief. And then I was like, oh, I, I found out like his his uh, partners. I find out the firm is like going away because I pulled it up and the website's gone and the firm's going away and that his partners are suing him. And I was like, yeah, yeah, must be real difficult. But yeah, they had to know what cases he's working on, what, you know, like they do have case meetings and they just stood by, they let this happen. So I shot it off to them too. <laughs> I mean, I was just like on a, hey, forwarding jag. Yeah. And and I have to tell you, after all these years, um, I feel so much better right now. Like I'm able to speak to you. And although I can't recall every single thing because there's like a million legs to the story, um, I'm enjoying myself talking to you because I feel so much better now. Yeah. And um, just it's it's like when somebody gets finally caught yeah. at something. Now, I did hear from other uh, clients of Girardi Keys, of Tom Girardi's, and uh, they're actually they have entertainment suits as well. And they sent me emails and Oh yeah. Tom told us like that he's uh, sued everybody in Hollywood. He's never lost. And I'm like, Oh my God, I remember him telling Larry that on the phone from his private plane. And um, it was like, there were so many things. It was like, you know, pushing dates, pushing dates, and then people presiding over hearings and, 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 and stuff that, you know, like they were associated with. So what do you think was the benefit of Girardi Keese throwing out your case? Well, I, I truly believe that um, his wife benefited. And so did he. Um, um, I do know, uh, or at least I heard from other uh, lawyers in L.A. that the media in L.A., like L.A. Times, like they, they weren't um, they didn't champion Tom Girardi. And uh, so this, uh, you, you know, so Tom produced his own magazine um, and he produced his own radio show. But now he's being embraced by, uh, you know, a network. Right. And, 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 and all of a sudden, I mean, like, I, I, and I couldn't turn around and I wasn't watching uh, that series, any of those, of the, of the franchises, you know, all of a sudden, his wife is on the cover of People magazine, you know, and like big cover story. I mean, this is like a year, like not even, I don't think it was a year out. And she is everywhere. And then she's on Dancing with the Stars. And then she's on this and, and that. And, and it's like, now, why wasn't Girardi blacklisted? And that's therefore, true. that's his a good point. Wife. That's yeah. a good point for going after because they were the ones that, ne- that technically went after the giant. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. For so many years. The timing, I will say, the timing seems very convenient and very coincidental. It's so interesting. It's so interesting. And I would tell it, I would show you all kinds of um, uh, files. Right. But Girardi Keys has never answered any of our requests since April of 2014 monthly requests up until the time Larry died uh, to return any of our files. They have cases and cases. Wow. So they've never even returned over, returned no. the files to you. No, absolutely not. Not. And, um, but I did hear from Graham uh, 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 a few weeks ago because I sent out another email r- requesting because I've sent out several requesting our stuff back to be sent to me. And uh, so he finally responded because I wrote something that wasn't very pleasant and he responded. Then we uh, went back and forth for 10 days via email, how he was going to, uh, that he had some, some of my files and, but he hasn't been in Girardi keys in a long time. So why does he have my files? Interesting. But he did, he didn't answer that. Well, I asked him. And, right and also it's, it's 2021 and the case was dismissed in 2014, right? 14. Yes. Yes. Wow. Yeah. A lot, uh, of, yeah. lot of time to go by. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I know I have a lot of silver in my hair and I didn't then. So yeah. <laughs> wow. 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 Yeah. So, um, 
Yeah. And I'm sure there's so many other points I could make. Right. And I apologize for not remembering everything. Off it's the top a lot of my head. and it's a long time. But I think the really interesting point is there were a lot of other there are stories that I've heard and a lot of clients have reached out to me and sent me other emails not all of them have been comfortable coming forward but they've sent me some of their stories and experiences and even with the ones that are public and are out there and being publicized a lot of the clients are claiming that the their firm was acting um was making decisions unbeknownst to them which is something that you said that a lot of yes. these delaying tactics were done unbeknownst to you and you didn't know until after the fact until after yes. they had already made those decisions without your consent yes yes uh, uh, multiple multiple times I, I mean and just why wouldn't they tell us that they were going to cancel our truck why would they do that when the judge rules yeah do it. Take, let's, we're going to trial, you know, and there's Howard Miller. It's like, there is nothing they can do. You know, it's like, you know, like, do you go think, look for a big house kind of thing? Is Howard still involved with the firm now? Oh, interestingly enough. No, he is um, a mediator at the same place that uh, we went for mediation. And when we went we were uh, really, it was under duress. We were like forced into it. Um, and uh, it wasn't, it was a couple days before Christmas in 2013. And we were told that we had to wait that long because uh, of, to, to be in front of one of the judges, it's one of Howard's good friends. And when we were there, uh, Tom Girardi was supposed to be there and he didn't show up. And Graham wouldn't talk to us. And Howard and uh, this Judge Stone, who seemed very, like, overly nice to us, which just was weird. And we were coached the day before. We weren't allowed to talk. And, and everything we read on mediation, and we consulted with Catherine, um, and who, who is a mediator. It's like, no, you bring your stuff. No, be prepared to, to speak. But they told us we were not allowed to speak. And um, at one point, I will never forget this. Um, judge Stone says to Howard, well, do you know this appellate uh, judge that's going to rule on, on, on this motion that's now this uh, time uh, statute? And he goes, no, I don't. But I understand she's a real tough cookie. And as it turns out, I don't know, maybe Howard has short-term memory issues now too, because, um, or at the time, because Howard had represented Tom Girardi in front of this judge wow. a couple of years earlier um, on some wrongdoing that Tom was uh, uh, accused, accused of. of. And, and apparently the judge went, don't do that again. Wow. And yeah, <laughs> so... Go figure. Wow, 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 Dana. Wow. What a, what a, an experience. I'm so sorry that you've had to go through that. I, I can hear oh, the, so the vindication that you feel now seeing that. And it's not just you. There are so many clients now that are coming forward with allegations against the yes. firm, against Tom, against some of the associates that now it's like, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. And there, there has yeah. to be something here. It's interesting to see a lot of the people he associated with kind of Dri dipping back and kind of saying, oh, well, I didn't know anything. I had no connection to him. I find yeah. that a little convenient. Um, you know, I know a lot of people have feelings about his wife, Erica, and whether or not she knew something or was involved in some way. You know, that's a whole other discussion. But it, it'll be interesting to see where this continues to transpire and unfold with with Mr. Girardi. Yeah. Well, I can tell you that um, after, uh, for, for a few months after April of 2014, um, we went to a lot of different law firms because we went, we're, we're going to go after Girardi Keys. I mean, this is so wrong. And um, uh, I, I, I mean, I was so sick. And uh, I mean, well, like naturally, but it was like, th there's no way these people should be able to get get away. Like we should get so hosed for being hosed and going after justice. You know, I mean, that's just so wrong. And, uh, 
every law firm came back to us. Yeah, you got hose, but we're not going up against Girardi. Over and over and over. It was like, oh my God, really? What? Really? Why? I, well. Do you think there's an opportunity for you to, to do something now? Is that something you're considering? Um, man, I would love to. I mean, seriously, if nothing more. I mean, now's the best. I mean, right? now's the best time I to mean, do it. I don't know if it's it's a smart yeah. move to make because he's losing everything. <laughs> seemingly, yeah. I mean, the point is, is like it's not going to bring Larry back. Yeah. that's for sure. And um, so it would it would only be for me at this point. Right. And um, yeah, I would I would enjoy it, but uh, I, I don't mind him going to prison for stealing money from, you know, widows and orphans and burn victims. And um, yeah, yeah, you know, and, and sometimes I think, oh my God, that they've got it so bad. And then I think, well, yeah, Larry doesn't have it any better either. Yeah. So, but uh, wow. so I, there, there is still the struggle, but um, I'm in a good place now. And, uh, and, and I got married Aww, and, and, and my husband was a stand-up comedian. So, and I knew him, I started dating him when I was 19, wow. when I first moved to Ohio. So, you know, he makes me laugh all the time and he's, he's a really great guy and he's very understanding and, um, you know, but, you know, I still have things to work through and, um, and he's helping me do that, which is amazing. And I've got really good friends here that, you know, have stood up. That's good. That's good. Yeah, I'm very yeah. happy to hear and, that. And you're just so adorable. And, and I, I cannot tell you how much I've enjoyed speaking with you. And, and thank you so much, really, for giving me this opportunity. And, and uh, because, oh, my God, it, it, it's like no, people, they don't want to uh, hear it from me in, in, a pri uh, in a public venue. You know, it's like, oh, no, you know, because they're afraid they're going to have some repercussion. Look, I've in the media. Yeah. And like, look, at the end of the day, I think, you know, it all comes back around. And I think we're seeing that there's been a lot of, you know, there are so many allegations now against Tom, against Girardi, Keese. And, you know, the truth is slowly starting to come out. And I think all we yeah. can do now is continue to ask questions and kind of see it all unfold. And I am very grateful for you to come forward oh. and to share your experience and to be so honest and transparent about what you went through. It's awful to hear what you went through, but it's so great to see this like sense of inner peace that you have now. So congrats on getting married. May Larry Thank rest you. in peace. I'm sure he Thank is. You. I'm sure he is looking at this now and even also has a little bit of vindication that he feels seeing, you know, the, the universe and karma kind of work its, its ways. I think so. He has shown up several times oh. and uh, it's always been good visits. That's good. good. Yes. Oh, uh -huh. happy to hear that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dana. I really appreciate you chatting with me today Thank you. and being so honest. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you guys for listening to the hashtag no filter with Zach Peter. That's me. You can always give me a follow at just plain Zach. Dana, do you have any social media or anything you want anybody to, to reach out to you or connect with you on or anything you want to promote? Um, well, <laughs> that's, that's so cute. Um, actually, you can go to danasmoller.com and it's D-A-E-N-A. -E -A. And uh, so it's just really kind of a, a resume and I'm producing some radio shows now, so... You know, but they can do their own publicity. Well, all right. I will. I look forward to seeing where you where you go next and what fun productions you have in the works. Hopefully, there'll be some fun reality shows or TV shows that I can watch again soon. Um, <laughs> thank you, Dana. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you. Be sure to give us a follow at No Filter with Zach to keep up with the show. Join our private Facebook group. The link is in the description below. And please leave me a five-star review because I love that validation. I'm a millennial and I need all that validation. So please give me those five-star reviews <laughs> on iTunes. You can also catch us on Spotify, YouTube. If you have a Roku device, you can watch the show on there. And get ready. More, more hot tea to be spilled next week, this Monday. Lots of new episodes later this year. Get ready. All right, guys. I'll talk to you later. Bye.